565 small and large princely states could not reconcile to the idea of being subsumed within the freedom movement led by the Indian National Congress. Three men tamed the uprising, Jawaharlal Nehru, Lord Mountbatten and Sardar Patel, with the force multiplier of VP Menon's persuasive skills. Princess Tan is that arguably never told story of how Nehru, Mountbatten and Patel made India. I'm Nikhila Natarajan in New York, the author of Princess Tan, Sandeep Bamzai, joins us from New Delhi. Mr. Bamzai, the source material for 240 pages of these revelations come from confidential documents bequeathed to you by your grandfather. When you scoured those papers, what are the patterns you saw in the relationships with, between these three men? And, and I'm not asking about their individual personas, Nehru, Mountbatten and Patel and how they related to each other. Could you speak to that, please? So uh, the starting point actually is 2006 when uh, I decided to take a brief sabbatical and uh, do something with my grandfather's papers because he had bequeathed them to me and he had told me that you should look at these and do something concrete and relevant, uh, which has a lasting impact on, on our uh, ecosystem. Uh, this is just before he passed away uh, years ago. But in 2006, uh, I decided that I needed to, needed to do something for his memory and for my father's memory. Because uh, my grandfather never, ever spoke about what he did. And even though I was close to him and he would take me every Sunday to the zoo and for his evening walks to Lodi Garden, he never, ever spoke about what he did. It is from my father that I gleaned certain facts because my father obviously grew up in this household and could hear and see what was happening. So my father was more of a raconteur than my grandfather ever was. And he used to tell me these stories about Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar Patel. Uh, so you you would listen and you would probably not believe everything. Uh, he would tell me that uh, they lived in the outhouse of the Prime Minister's house on 17 York Road. Uh, and he would say that uh, uh, Panditji would come out and say, Jawar kya kar My father's name was also Jawar Lal. He was named after Panditji because my grandfather obviously was besotted by Nehru. And I think many people of that generation were. Uh, so he, he would tell me stories that ja uh, Panditji would come out and my father would be pottering in the garden as a 11, 12 year old. And he would say, Jawar kya kar uh, Chalo, uh, Sheikh Saab, aaj, uh, Kashmir mein chhut rahe or Airport pe aare. And the two of them would go, that is my father and Panditji to welcome uh, Sheikh Abdullah. And then there was another story that he used to tell me that uh, another day he was pottering in the garden and again Panditji came out and again he asked him the same thing, Jawar kya kar rahe? And he said ki Sardar Patil ka ek, uh, ki ek takreer hai jis mein mujhe jana hai. So, uh, now how do you actually sit down and believe this. So the best way was photographs don't lie. And all over our home, these pictures were there of my father holding Sheikh Abdullah and Jawaharlal Nehru's hand standing at Saptajan airport. So there's no way you can't believe it. On page 100, we encounter this moment near the elevator, right? Where um, uh, it's August 31st, 1945, and Winston Churchill is telling Lord Wavell to quote, keep a bit of India. Um, I stayed on that page for quite a while. You know, that gave hope to Wavell, to the princes, but, and then Churchill himself got thrown out, replaced by Attlee. So when the knives were out on all flanks, how mm -hmm. did Nehru, Mountbatten, and Patel hold out in those specific circumstances? The reason I ask is because between page 100 and 101, the story quickly moves to Travancore. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm still wondering, what is it in those papers that you have that fills in that piece? It's fascinating. See, now, uh, let me rewind a bit. Uh, before my grandfather became OSD to Jawaharlal Nehru, he was a journalist. And he was the special representative of the Blitz in New Delhi. And those cuttings 
are part of the treasure trove that he left behind. And those cuttings, believe me, are in fantastic shape. No silverfish, nothing. Huh? Now, those cuttings are, I mean, at one level, you cannot imagine the way uh, they've been written. The sheer construct of that is, is amazing because all those pieces on the front page of the Blitz, which was a powerful newspaper of, of that time, it is all in first person. I asked Jinnah. I asked Mountbatten. I asked Nehru. And then Nehru responds, or Mountbatten responds, or Sardar Sahib responds, or Jinnah responds. And in those stories, I found these stories. The stories of Keep a Bit of India. Stories of how Travancore did a deal with the British to sell them thorium in return of independence, in lieu of independence. The story of Maharaja Hari Singh who vacillated right to till the end. And in fact, crossed the board, borderline as it were, the threshold of August 15, and only succumbed to acceding to India when the raiders were knocking at his door. So every story, the story of the Nawab of Bhopal, who Jinnah promised the governor generalship of Pakistan in return for Hyderabad remaining out of the ambit of India. So these are multiple princes doing multiple things, but trying, and believe me, it's not just the princes, it's the prime ministers. So it is Ram Chandra Khan. They're all devious. All of them are devious. All of them are playing their part. All of them want to stay outside the ambit of India. And it is, it's actually a relay run there. Nehru, who starts with this anti-monarchial because of his Fabian socialist mindset. Then he hands over the patent to Mountbatten when Mountbatten finally comes to India. And then Mountbatten hands the patent over to Sardar Patel. It's actually a brilliantly constructed piece of running. So Nehru front runs this whole thing, challenges the princes at every given opportunity, speaks his mind, virtually abuses them, tears them down, thrashes them. Then Mountbatten comes into the picture. And Mountbatten, all the princes think that Mountbatten, who came as the aide-de-camp, took the king when the king visited India, would be favorably disposed and inclined towards them. And that he would represent the paramountcy as the paramountcy, and he would help them stay out of the ambit of India. It doesn't happen. There is a conversation which you must have read where Mountbatten and Sardar Patel are talking to each other, and Patel tells him, I want the whole basket of apples. Not one out of the 565 has to stay out. I want it all. And then, of course, Sardar being Sardar takes each and every prince down systematically, working in conjunction with VP Minute. But yeah. actually, the but defining, the, the no, defining let's, moment, let's, no, let's, I just want to add one yeah, thing. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. The defining moment, the defining moment is Lord Mountbatten's invitation to these princes, big and small, and challenging them and telling them that they will have to sign with one of the two dominions. This is, I think, if I remember right, July 15, 1947. So it's days before independence. It's D minus 30, actually. That speech is probably the defining moment in this in this story because the princes are dismayed. Gopal is virtually in tears. He cannot imagine that the British are, you know, even as they're decolonizing, that the British are leaving their subjects, their true loyal subjects behind. But it happens. And that July 15 speech of Mountbatten, which, you know, it just throws these people into a complete tailspin, is, is something from where Patel takes over. And then, of course, you know that by July, by August 15, India became independent. And they continued till the end, thinking that they will construct a third dominion. And that third dominion would be called Princeton. So there would be Hindustan. Pakistan and Prince Ispan. And Churchill being Churchill, a monarchist himself, that, that story that you're uh, uh, repeating here, when Wavell visits him, he tells him, keep a bit of India. And Wavell is a true monarchist, just as Churchill is. And between the two of them and Sir Conrad Corfield, who is the head of the British political department and controls the princes through residence, uh, British residents all across these uh, princely families and controls their minds, their purses, their security, everything. 
he too plays this game. And Nehru abhors Gorefield, as you will as you will read in the book. And Nehru continues to smash Gorefield whenever the opportunity arises in front of Mountbatten, in front of Sardar Patel. And he he has this completely. He he is seen as a malevolent character. This uh, this Gorefield. And and the architecture is such that Jinnah, of course, is involved in it because Jinnah, Churchill, Bevel, Corfield, and the saboteur, as I call him, the number one saboteur, the Nawab of Bhopal, Hamidullah Khan, who represents all the big princes who want to stay out of the ambit of uh, the Indian National Congress. They keep plotting, they keep trying, but it doesn't work out. So I'm going to turn to page 185. You quote Alex Von Tunzelman writing in Indian yeah. Summer about how Mountbatten and Patel in less than a year achieved a larger India, more closely integrated than had 90 years of the British Raj, 180 years of the Mughals, or 130 years of Ashoka and the Maurya um, ruling. So how Patel was impervious to Mountbatten's charm while he arranged, as I quote, the revolution. This theme threads itself through the entire book. Um, Repeatedly, they show how Patel uh, encircles certain princes, uh, challenges them, uh, lets loose VP Menon on them. And VP Menon is a infantryman, he's a soldier. He's the man who fights in the trenches. So he assiduously takes on Sardar Saab's idea and then goes and goes deep into India, meets these princes, the princes who are unwilling, the princes who are not listening, the princes who are recalcitrant. He goes after each one of them. And there are enough stories about how he breaks them down individually. And then, of course, between Patel and Mountbatten, they break them down collectively completely. And then there is the next process, which is the reorganization of the states. These princely states clubbing them together, Katiawad on the west, Orissa on the east, how small princely states were then clubbed together, the states were created, the reorganization took place. And I don't think very honestly that B.P. Menon is given due credit for the work that he did in the reorganization of the Indian states. He is the foot soldier, the man who goes, drives, takes a train, flies, goes and meets various princes, including Maharaja Hari Singh. It is famously told that when V.P. Menon comes back with the instrument of accession, he says very loudly uh, to the all the people who had gathered in 17 York Road, including Panditji, um, uh, Sardar Baldev Singh, uh, and of course Sardar Patel, he walks in uh, with the instrument of accession and says, the bastard finally signed it, referring to Maharaja Hari Singh. And I'll tell you one thing, Nikola, uh, without Mountbatten, this would not have been achieved. I call Mountbatten the decolonizer. He is the decolonizer. He is the man who retreats. The British Empire sets with Mountbatten leaving India. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, let's take a step back now. One of the reasons we study history is to remind ourselves that no matter how crazy the world might be right now, it's rarely unprecedented. Take chapter three, for instance, Instance, Darbari oligarchs, the diamonds, the debauchery, it's wild. But a question emerges from it. What could decades of Congress governments have done any differently to reduce, say, wealth disparities in India? I know, I mean, look, none of us have the answers, but the question certainly emerges. Well, I would think uh, uh, Mrs. Gandhi is the person who abolished the privy princes, the uh, privy purses, and uh, left the princes with, you know, they were they were stunned at what she had managed to do. Uh, maybe she could have done this earlier, or maybe some some other politician could have done this earlier. Uh, maybe Shastriji could have done it. Maybe Nehru himself could have done it earlier. It is only uh, Mrs. Gandhi with her grand vision of, of being able to see beyond the apparent in most cases. Uh, remember that she nationalized coal, insurance, petroleum, banking. Uh, the same woman then decides to do away with the privy purses. And then these princes who were being given money, first by the British and then by the government of India, uh, then 
you know, had to uh, learn how to survive on their own. And then, of course, some of them gave, gave up their homes, they turned them into palaces and hotels and whatever. But maybe uh, to cut the umbilical cord with the British monarchy and the paramountcy, uh, perhaps some politician or prime minister could have taken this decision to abolish the privy purse maybe earlier. There's a piece on leadership, page 158. VP Menon uh, writes about Sardar Patel's leadership being in a different category where he chose his men and then trusted them entirely without getting into all the details, without full and frank uh, consultation, uh, quote. So, I mean, this is all of us, right? Uh, when uh, the actual independence plan is working out, it is uh, Lady Edwina who asks VP Menon to go to Shimla. And she tells him to go to Shimla, or rather rush to Sh Shimla, because both Mountbatten and Nehru are present in Shimla. And to wrap this up, this is the moment. Go there, meet both of them, and crack it. Which is exactly how it pans out. So Menon travels to Shimla, meets Nehru, meets Mountbatten, Mountbatten has what is called the Dickey, Dickey Bird Plan, which Nehru is completely opposed to. But Menon gets Nehru and Mountbatten both on the same page. And finally, that independence thing goes and it starts, starts getting traction. Menon then from Shimla calls up Sardar Patel and calls him up and says that the two of them have arrived at a conclusion. The two plans are no longer two plans, but is one. The Dickey Bird plan has more or less been junked. Nehru has accepted. Mountbatten has accepted. Patel asks Menon, are you happy with it? Patel is not in Shimla, mind you. Menon says that I think this is workable. Patel says, go ahead. That's how the independence wheels were set in motion. The final independence wheels were set in motion. When I say the final independence, I mean August 15th. Uh, and the actual leaving by the British from India. So look at the train of thought, or look at the sequence of events in this case. It is Lady Edwina who advises. I mean, Edwina is always this woman who Nehru uh, is supposed to be in love with or whatever. But it is Edwina who suggests to Menon, rush to Shimla because you will catch both of them there. Sit with both of them, crack it wide open. Menon does it. Menon calls Patel. Patel says yes. That's how it all fructifies. And, and, and can you can you imagine this is in an age when there is no there are no real genuine communications? There are no mobile phones. Phones by themselves are an oddity. And getting through from one city or state to another those days. I mean, we've also seen it lightning calls and stuff like that. So this all this is done in a matter of a few days and hours by. And the four dramatis personae in this are Patel, Nehru, Mountbatten, and VP Menon. And that's why in this story of the invisible men, the faceless people who have contributed to our independence, these four actually stand out. Because the, the India as we know it, the India that we live in, is the construct of these four people. What's it about Menon that... Um that makes him this pers person who was constantly underestimated, underrated, generally, minus some of the spotlight. Because you, you're right here, um, all this would not have been possible without Menon. He was the mason who let, laid the edifice for integration. He became Sardar mm -hmm. Patel's instrumentality, a potent weapon. He had his own network and intelligence service, yes. which he used most effectively. And that's how the book ends. Yeah. This is why I'm saying that while these three are giants of their time, two of them, or three of them actually, uh, are Anglophiles. Nehru, Patel, and Jinnah are all Anglophiles, all, bar all barristers at law. Gandhi, even he's an Anglophile, all barristers at law, all well-versed in the art of warfare because they studied there, they lived there, they understood the nuances uh, of how the British operated. Here is this man who represents the invisible, nameless, faceless Indian. That is VP Menon. And his job is to assiduously 
go from one part of the country to another part of the country at Patel's behest, because Patel, I think if I'm not mistaken, around June or July 1947, is given the uh, Ministry of States. Uh, he is not just the Home Minister, he is given additionally the Ministry of States. And that is when he is galvanized into action, and that is when the actual reorganization process takes place. Uh, again, if I'm not right, uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong, he is... Uh, Menem is attached to that Ministry of States, and that is where this relationship and bonding between Patel and Menem uh, is is created, and then exists for for time for some time till all the princes are are in the bag. Mr. Bamzai, thank you so much for your time. Not at all. Uh, most welcome. Great conversation. Thank you so much.